uh, take your Bibles and go to Acts chapter 2. Um, we're in a series last week. Sean did a What If We Lived uh, When Generational, you know, where we cross generational, uh, old and young, and, and, and mixed. And uh, this week we're going to look briefly at a topic I've called What If We Lived Like the First Century Church? And um, we're going to briefly look at some of these aspects of what they did. And we'll actually continue in this next week uh, in a similar fashion to what we're going to cover next week. But if you would, go to Acts chapter 2, and starting in verse 41. Now this is after the day, this is the day of Pentecost. Many um, associate with Pentecost with uh, the birth of the Christian church. It's when the Spirit was poured out. It's when the church began to live um, with this new spirit, with Christ as the head, and they began moving out from Jerusalem. Um, and it says here in Acts 2, verse 41, So then those who received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. In Acts chapter 1, it says there were about 120 uh, hanging around. And here on that day, 3,000 people were added to the church. Now, if this happened in our day and time, in our culture, uh, the, the tendency of the thing might be to say, hey, I think we should build a mega church. Right? you got 3,000 people. This is perfect. We could fill our funds. We could build this big church. You have everybody come in here to Jerusalem and, whoo, let's, let's, let's go that way. Um, but that's not what they did. And I, uh, as we get through this, I, I, I tend to think that what they did is how Christ led them. That they, that they acted the way they were led by that spirit that they had received. That the way they uh, conducted their church was as Jesus Christ was directing it. And I think we can learn from this. And, and, and so I posed to you, what if, we, what if we lived this way today? What if we actually did what they did? What would it be like? Acts chapter 2, then after this happens, this is, how they, this is what they did. It says, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to doctrine, and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread, and to prayers. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together, and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions, and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. That's what they did. So I want to take uh, these items and look at them individually. Um, and I have them here on this chart. Uh, five things specifically I'd like to look at this morning. Now, um, I don't really think I could do justice. Each one of these topics could be a complete teaching on its own. I don't think I'm really going to do justice. Um, so I encourage you to look at these because each one of these could be a complete teaching on its own. But the, specifically, the five things, it says they continually devoted. Now, they continually devoted to all of these items. They continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They continually devoted themselves to fellowship. They continually devoted themselves to breaking bread. They continually devoted themselves to prayer. And then it says they had all things common, sharing of their abundance as anyone had need. And we want to look at, I want to look at these five things. The first one here is that they were devoted to teaching or to doctrine. They were devoted to the gospel message. The gospel specifically, as you look through the book of Acts, as you look at the teachings of Jesus, they were particularly devoted to the teaching of the gospel of the kingdom, the message of the kingdom of God. It's the, what it starts out, Acts, Jesus was teaching his disciples, uh, was teaching about the things concerning the kingdom of God. And the book of Acts ends, the last chapter of Acts, Paul is teaching the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. It is the topic that's throughout the scriptures. And um, doctrine was not an unimportant thing to the first century church. Oh, it doesn't matter. Believe whatever I want you to believe. Um, but the message of the gospel, the truth from scriptures about who Jesus is and what was accomplished through Jesus Christ is paramount in first century Christianity. They were very concerned with doctrine. Uh, just want to read a couple of these. There's a lot you can go to. In Acts 8, this one I always appreciated. Acts 8 is where Philip goes to Samaria. He preaches Christ, and then, and then an angel tells him to go out to uh, Gaza. He goes to Gaza and meets this guy in a chariot. The guy's reading. He's, in, he's got the scroll of Isaiah, and he's reading it. 
And I love Philip. Uh, and Philip goes up to him and says, do you under-? he's reading from Isaiah, and he says, uh, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, how can I, except some man should teach me? And Philip's response to him was not, hey, come to church. My pastor, boy, he can help you out here. Come, you know. No, right then and there, Philip takes him to the scripture. Right there in this chariot, out in the desert of Gaza. He takes him to the scripture. And it's in Acts chapter uh, 8 here in verse uh, 35. It says, then Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture. He preached Jesus to him. So from that point, he takes him to scripture. So I ask you, can you do that? Can you, while you're at work and something comes up, can you take people to understand who Jesus is and what about the gospel and the message uh, you know, you got your, your cell phone with a Bible. Can you at least go to that? Can you take a Bible out and, and, and show scriptures as to why you believe what you believe? Are you able to do that? It's a good challenge. I think they were able to do that in the first century church. Scripture and doctrine was very important to them. Paul is a great example in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 and in verse 2. Acts 17, 2, it says, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths, or for three weeks, reasoned with them from where? From the scriptures. Now, the, the scriptures that Paul would have had to his disposal was the Old Testament, the, the Hebrew scriptures, because Paul wrote most of the New Testament, so he wasn't using that. He was using Old Testament scriptures. And he went to the scriptures explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, is the Messiah. Can you do that? Can you take someone to the Old Testament scriptures and show them through scriptures who Jesus is? Can you explain what it means that Jesus is the Messiah? What does that mean? What, what does that mean that Jesus is the Messiah? Do you know? You should. It's a very important concept of Christianity. But I would venture to say most people that I talk to don't know what it means that Jesus is the Messiah. And I think these are things we should be concerned with. We should know these basic fundamental truths of Scripture, of who Jesus is, and what the Scriptures say about this messianic one that would come from the line of David. Um, and that's what Paul did. He reasoned with them from the scriptures. And then you go down to Acts uh, uh, verse 10 here. Paul leaves from Thessalonica in verse 10, and the brethren immediately sent Paul away by, to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, and for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures, how long? Daily, daily, to see whether these things were so. Um, these were the Brians, and we have our fellowship, which will start back up in the fall on Monday, every second and fourth Monday, called our Berean Fellowship, where um, we've been reading the Bible together. Um, and it comes after this understanding here that these were Bereans. They were noble. They searched daily. They searched. And the reason we started that fellowship is because we wanted to know what the Bible said. And we started it reading and starting in the book of Genesis. And we said, what does the Bible say? And so we started our Berean Fellowship to do that because it's important for us to have a scriptural understanding of why we believe what we believe. And I don't think it's just supposed to be for the pastor. I think now with the Spirit of Christ within us, each individual person has the ability to know and to learn and that you can be taught and understand and to be able to share and preach with others. Um, Acts chapter 28, verse 23 Uh, this is Paul at the, end of, at the end of the book of Acts. Look what he's doing. Acts 28, verse 23. And when they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging. He's, he's been incarcerated, taken on a ship. He's now in Rome. These people come to him at his lodging in large number. And he was explaining to them by solemnly testing, uh, testifying about what? The kingdom of God. And trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses, again, the Old Testament, and from the prophets from morning until evening. 
from morning till evening, he's teaching with them about the kingdom of God from the Old Testament scriptures. Here at the end of Acts, this is what Paul is doing. It's an important thing to understand our doctrine. It's important to understand why we believe what we believe. Um, if you don't know why you believe what you believe, you know what? You can get talked out of it. And you can believe something maybe that's false. So it's important to learn and to understand and comprehend. Um, we uh, here at the church try and teach. And what's the reason we have our biblical education classes? Uh, is to teach doctrine. And um, I wanted to let you know, I think we've mentioned this once before, but in the fall, we will start up our biblical education class again. And uh, Reverend Finnegan and I are going to be teaching, which we haven't done at a biblical, on our BEC night, we're going to teach the Kingdom Covenants class, where we're going to go through the Bible on these covenants. And really, I can tell you, as I'm listening over, I'm going back over the material we taught like about 15 years ago. It's been a while. Um, it's really fundamental information. If you don't know about the covenants in the Bible, and how that pertains to you today, and how that pertains to understanding the kingdom of God and our future hope, um, I highly recommend you take part of this. And that's going to be coming in the fall when we do our education class. And, and learn about these things in the scripture. So uh, that's a, it's coming up. But Paul warned against false doctrines. Um, here in 2 Timothy, I have these notes uh, these from 2 Timothy there's many things he wrote, but here he, he's, he's admonishing Timothy, and look at the things he says here. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of. He said, Paul, Timothy, what things you have learned and the things you have become convinced of. Are you convinced of what you believe? Are you convinced of the truth of the gospel message? You see, that's why I, I'm not, like, I can talk with any Christian. I can talk with anyone that ha might have a difference of opinion about doctrine because I'm pretty convinced about what I believe. And it doesn't threaten me to talk with someone in a meek and gentle understanding and be humble and say, well, maybe I can learn something from you and not be threatened because I have learned and have become convinced of the doctrine of the gospel message. So are you convinced of what you believed, knowing whom you have learned them and that from a childhood you have known the sacred writings, you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know why the scriptures are important? Because it brings salvation to the world. This is the knowledge. You know, my, you know our good personality and our church building and people coming here does not bring salvation. What brings salvation is the gospel preached and people believed. And that's why it's so important to have doctrine. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Then he goes on in chapter 4. I solemnly charge you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. Because Jesus Christ is coming back to judge the living and the dead, and the answer to the world is the word of God. Preach the gospel message. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebu rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They're not going to endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. And will turn away their errors from the truth and turn aside to myths. You see, the church should never become where it's socially, where you're trying to teach a social agenda to get people to come to your church. Where you teach because it's, it's vogue and people like to hear the message. The message is nice to their ears. That was never the first century church. The first century church was committed to the doctrine of the gospel message that brings salvation, just as Jesus Christ in the gospels was committed to the message of the kingdom. And it was confronting, but it's what we are to do. So that's the first thing. Be devoted to doctrine. It's important. Next thing was devoted to fellowship. And please go to Hebrews. Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, you know, what is fellowship? You know, I, I, fellowship to me is hanging out together, being with each other, being together, whatever that means, whether you're working together, playing together, work, uh, going, you know, going to the store together, uh, 
be together, fellowship. Um, look at Hebrews 10. I love this in Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have been confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated through us, the, that veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as a habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Jesus Christ is coming back. And you know what? You could hang out with your television set. And you can hang out on Facebook. And you can hang out on, um, at work with people. And you can hang out. But you know what? The world, there is a, I believe there's a God of this world. And his design is not to draw you closer to God. And his design is not to get you with the hope of Jesus Christ's return to be central to your heart. It is our desire. And that's why we fellowship together. We don't forsake the assembly, but we go out of our way to fellowship one, with one another. It's a beautiful thing. We should just try and find any reason why we can hang out together. Let's do it. And, and it can't just be once a week on Sunday. That's one day out. You've got six other days of the week. Well, what are we doing? Let's get together. Let's fellowship one with another. They were devoted to being with each other and to fellowship in this way. We need fellowship one another to encourage as the day is approaching. And this is similar. They were devoted to breaking bread. They were devoting to eating together. Hey, I like that, right? <laughs> They're devoting to food. Devoted to breaking bread together. And this is, this is all through the scriptures. Um, if you would, uh, you can keep, anyone, we're going to come back to Acts, but in uh, Luke chapter 14. Um, You'll see this is repeated again in Acts 2.46, this breaking of bread. So it's an important thing that they did. Um, I think that they really gained an understanding of this, the importance of eating meals together from Jesus, from the Lord Jesus. So I wanted to just put out a question to many of you, and you can answer if you got. Can anybody tell me in the Gospels, um, just throw out a record of where Jesus ate with somebody? Anybody, can anybody tell me one? Last Supper, right, that was right. Lazarus' house, right? He went to Lazarus' house. Zacchaeus, right? He went home with Zacchaeus. Nate was Zacchaeus. What's that? He fed the five thousand, right? Well, that was out in out in the wilderness. They did that, right? The fair, right? Uh, Simon the Pharisee. That's right. He went to Simon's house. Oh, Emmaus, right at the end. Yes, yes, at the end, at the end, after his resurrection, he went home to eat. So Jesus did this a lot. Matter of fact, he got in trouble and was accused of eating with publicans and sinners, right? So, so yeah, so, so eating together was something that Jesus kind of did, and I think the disciples just carried this on into the first century church. Um, uh, look at these. We're supposed to be given to hospitality. Hebrews 13.1. Let love of the brethren continue. It's up here in the chart. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this have, some have entertained angels without knowing it. Wouldn't that be cool? You know, invite someone to your house. You never you met. Hey, why don't you come home to eat with me? And it was an angel. Wouldn't that be great? I mean, why not? Right? It could happen. It has happened. I mean, you know, wouldn't that be cool? So, so you know, don't. Don't count on a stranger, right? It's not only, not only within the body, but it's a great way to bring, in, bring people into the body of Christ. To invite them to your house and, and, and have a meal together is a great thing. And then, of course, 1 Peter 4, 9 says, Be hospitable one to another without complaint. Um, here in Luke 14 is a, is a great um, record that Jesus wrote, and I, I, I always love this. And... Uh, and he says in verse 12, he also went on to say to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, when you have a dinner and you have a big gathering and you're having food, do not invite your friends 
or your brothers, or your relatives, or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. There, I think, is a something we should consider. That's something Jesus said. Wow. Don't just invite your friends. Look out and see who needs, who's in need. And as Jesus said in the one parable, when you were hungry, you fed me. When you were thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was sick, you visited me. He said, if you do it to these people, you'll have done it to me. It is, it is, it is the way of our Lord. I don't think this is just something they did because they liked it. I think it was something that was instructed to them through the spirit of Christ within them. Um, Next, they were devoted to prayer, to prayer. They were devoted to prayer. And boy, this is all through the, the Word of God. It's just big. Look at Acts chapter 1. Um, again, I think this they also learned from Jesus. You follow Jesus Christ. I mean, he was praying all the time. There's one time where he went, he went all day long teaching and preaching. It says until nighttime. And then the next verse says early in the morning, while it was still dark, he went out into a solitary place and prayed. He would always go to the way and we'd go up in the mountain and he'd pray together. They'd say, Lord, teach us to pray. And he taught them how to pray. And then there's, there's that great uh, record in Luke 18, 1 with the, with the parable of the widow. Where the reason he gave him that parable was to that, that people should always pray and not lose heart. This was, this was Jesus, and I think the first century church, again, just as with the eating, I think this, this type of prayer has just continued on in to the instruction with the Lord in the first century. In Acts chapter 1, before Pentecost, they returned from Jerusalem in verse 12, uh, from the Mount Olivet near Jerusalem. And they entered the city, they went into an upper room in verse 13. And then you go down to verse 14. These all, with one mind, were continually devoting themselves to what? Prayer. They were devoted to prayer, along with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. They were devoted to prayer. They didn't just like to pray. They didn't just kind of pray. They were devoted to it. And as Sean shared, one of the reasons what we do at our church when we open a prayer is because we want prayer to be a part of, we don't want just to have formal, you know, religious prayers. We want individuals to be able to pray. And it's one, you know, that's just an avenue that we do here at the church, but it's so much bigger than just Sunday morning. We want to be devoted to this prayer. Um, and this is repeated through the church epistles, Ephesians, again, on the chart. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times, all times, in the Spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all saints. Colossians 4.2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Okay. Not only did they do it, here we're instructed to do that. Keep it alert in with an attitude of thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. Pray. I also going to say we do the meals things here at the church too every once in a while. And again, that is in accordance with this, is that we like to get together and do meals. Um, and on Sundays, some you know, will turn the church over and bring tables out and we'll eat together because of these verses. Um, I know, is this still going on, Andy, in August? Can I announce that? Andy's going to have a barbecue at his house coming up Woo! in August. Is that going to be the Saturday after teen camp? Is that when that is? The 24th. So we're going to be having a meal. Andy's going to open his house for a barbecue up there again. And then I'll announce this too. This hasn't been announced yet either. Boy, I'm, I'm full of announcements. September, around the second Sunday in September after Labor Day weekend, it is going to be 20 years that we've had this church building. And we're going to have a 20th year anniversary. And we're going to, we're going to have fellowship that night. We're going to, I think we might dance. I think we might do some dancing, some card playing, and then the, on that Sunday we're going to have a fellowship and we're going to have a meal afterwards. So just put that in. Again, that's news. Hot off the press information just right in there. So, um, but that's why we do these things, because eating together is important. Praying together is important. Um, but again, it shouldn't just be here on Sunday. Um, I love, I, we just did with our family the other day. We went out, the four of us went out to eat uh, at, a, at a restaurant, right? And, and they bring us our food, 
And we stop and we pray. And the, and the waiter, so if she forgets something, she comes back. Because we're praying <laughs> out in public. I love that. Because, you know, people don't do that. You know, you don't see that. To pray in public, to be in a group. Like, like, like uh, I know, uh, like when we used to hike, when Blake would do the, the video, and, and he'd have all these crews, some of them people were atheists, some of them were, they just came to hike, but he would get together and we'd pray together. You know, like to get together and pray where people see us. I mean, it, it is a witness of what we believe. It is the way we should be before we do things together. What, how about we pray? Be devoted to it. And all the things, that's what they did in the first century. They were devoted to prayer. I love this, this uh, part of Romans. Now, Acts chapter 2, um, Paul didn't even come around for like 14 years. I, I, I don't know how long it was afterwards. It was a long time before Paul, from Acts chapter 2, by the time Paul wrote the book of Romans. Well, what do we think? What do you think that is? 30 years? Maybe more? You know, so this was, this was a long time. So the book of Acts, so you could say, you know, they did this, they did this in the book of Acts, but they really weren't. They didn't know what they were doing, right? They should have been building church buildings and you know, should have had this real formal religious thing and had stained glass windows. And, you know, they really should have done that, you know, that that really was the way they should have started functioning if, if they were really, you know, on with it. Um, but by 30 years when Paul, you would think that, you know, he would give instructions on how the church is supposed to function. And, and if it was different than what they did on the day of Pentecost, he would tell us, I would think, Right. Well, look what it says in Romans here of what Paul writes of how the church is supposed to function. And look how similar this is to what they did on the day of Pentecost. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor not lagging behind in diligent, fervent in the spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, continue, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Wow, that sounds to me like the same thing of what they did on Pentecost. Paul, over 30 years later, is instructing the church, this is how you're supposed to live. This is how the church is to function. What if we did this? What if we did this? And I really wanted to spend the last time on this last one here uh, to close out our time together. The last thing I want to look at is that they had all things common and they shared their abundance. Um, look at Acts chapter 4. Not only is this recorded that they did this in Acts 2, but a very similar thing is recorded in Acts chapter 4. Acts 4, and in verse 32. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And look at this verse here. And not one of them, not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own. But all things were common property to them. What is that? And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them. They didn't have a needy person in the church. For all who were owners of lands or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as they had need. Wow. Not one of them claimed that anything he had was his own. Come on. Isn't that what it's all about? It's mine. It's my house. It's my car. Right? It's my cell phone. It's my remote. Right? The TV. I bought that TV. Right? It's mine, 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 mine. They didn't, they didn't say anything that they possessed was their own. That is a radical concept. In our day and time, in our commercial-driven Western society, I ask myself, could the church 
truly live this way in this commercialized, covetous world that we live in? Could the church ever really function like this? What a radical thought. Now, it's, you see, this wasn't a government program. You know, I think that's what we do. We want, to, we want to institutionalize this and try and force it on everybody. It doesn't, that's not what's going on here. This is not from the top down structured institution. This is from within the spirit of Christ within a person being committed to Jesus Christ as his Lord and living the way Christ would direct it. Otherwise, it's, it's fabric manufactured. And I think a lot of charities, a lot of institutions started with this heart. But then what happens is they become an institution. And they become this big uh, corporation and this big administration. And you have all this. And it loses the heart. This is individual deciding to live this way. And it takes a decision of the heart. Um, they sold their property and possessions and it's shared with those in need. I just, I talk to so many people that have second homes where I work. A lot, it's like everybody's got a summer home. They got a summer camp up there. I, I don't know where they get the money for that. But they, you know, they got summer homes. They got second homes. They got two cars. They got three cars. Sometimes they got two cars and they got a truck. And they got a boat. And they got this. And they, they got all this stuff. And, uh, we got to, could we change? Could, could the church actually live like the first century church? It starts from within. It starts from a person's desire to live like Christ. Could this happen in our Western culture? Are we too filled with covetousness? Look at Luke. Look at some of the words of Jesus. Um, and while we're doing that, Hebrews 13, 5 through 6 says, Make sure that your character is free from the love of money. Make sure of this, that your character is free from the love of money. Being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Be content with what you have and do not and be free from the love of money. Luke 12. Look at this. Luke 12, what Jesus said here. Luke 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. Now, you know what? Have you ever been involved with a family inheritance dispute? This is real, all right? This is real stuff that happens. When, 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 the, when the person dies and all the kids want to fight over the, right? You make a, blah, 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 me, what about me? Right? I love Jesus' answer. But he said to him, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, look at this, beware and be on guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. If you have a difficulty with covetousness, if this is something that you struggle with, you should take that verse and put it on your refrigerator. Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For even one that has abundance, his life does not consist of his possessions. Your life does not consist of the things that you think you own. And a lot of people don't really own what they own. They are in debt to somebody else. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down the barns and build bigger ones. And there I will gather all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you. 
And now who will own what you have prepared? <laughs> so is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is rot rich toward God. You know what? Everything you think you own, if you die tomorrow, guess what? <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. So where should our confidence be? Where should our life be? Where should our heart be? And then he says in verse 33, again, this is Jesus, and I think they're just following along. When the book of Acts started, I think they're just following along in the instructions with the Spirit of Christ leading them, leading the way Christ would lead them. And it says in verse 33, sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourself money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. <laughs> Sell your possessions and give it away. Give it away. You know, one of the great things I love about our country is any time that you want to, you can take your stuff and you can put it out in your yard. And you can find a sign out there that says yard sale. And people will come by and buy it. It's so cool you can do that. It's called a yard sale garage sale. Get rid of your stuff. And I've done this before. But you know what I've always done in the past? After I do that, look at all my money! <laughs> now I can go buy this! That, no, wait, 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 wait. That's not what Jesus said. That's not what they did in the first century church. They had their garage sale and from the money, they gave it to people in need. Whoa! What if we live that way? What if we really, truly lived like the first century church? Wow. It's pretty confronting, isn't it? It's pretty big. You, your head starts, starts thinking about these things. And I think one of the problems in our society is, you know one of the big problems is? People are in debt. Check out this stat. This was from 2018 from the Planning to Progress study by Northwest Mutual. Credit cards, student loans, mortgages, car loans, personal loans, most Americans have a combination of these sources of debt. And despite their best intentions, Americans are digging themselves deeper into a hole each year. The average American now has about $38,000 in personal debt, excluding mortgages. The average. $38,000? $38,000 in debt! You know, at 10% interest, that's $3,800. You're just given to a bank. And if it's credit cards, the interest is a lot higher than that. $38,000, what is that? That's the average American. That's, that's a lot of debt. And then our government is like, Trillion dollars in debt? What is that? You, you, look at where, where, where this is heading. It can't sustain. You know, we've got to wake up. It cannot be sustained. And, you know, we can could, we could write to our congressman. And we, but you know what? I can't change that. I can change this individual. You understand? This is a conviction of an individual who says, Darn it all, I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. I'm going to stop this craziness. I'm going to live like Christ said to live. How in the world could you ever give to others if you're $38,000 in debt? You see, because we're so busy with all this stuff we got to have, i got to have that. I mean, I want to let you in on a little insight. Did you know there was a time when people didn't have cell phones. <laughs> I'm serious. You know what it costs to own a cell phone and for your monthly charges? And some people have these plans. But oh, you, you gotta have that now. You know, and I, I'm not saying against cell phones, I'm just saying think who's driving you? Who's directing what you do? with your personal finances. And I think this starts not from a top down, this starts from an individual 
convicted in Christ, who is going to live for Jesus Christ. That's how it starts. And um, uh, the first thing I think is uh, the best way you can help the church, first off, the best way you help the church in this thing, take care of yourself. One of the great ways to help the church is take care of yourself and not be dependent on somebody else. Be dependent on God yourself. Don't be the one that's always in need. Be the one that has to give. You decide that you're going to live to give and not be a burden on someone else. Individual responsibility, where you take that on to do that. I love what it says in Proverbs 3, 5 through 10. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body, refreshments to your bones. Honor Yahweh from your wealth and from the first fruits of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats overflowing with new wine. And I, new wine. And I think this is the tithe. I think the tithe... I think the tithe is your personal devotion to God. It's where you're putting your trust in God, that God is your sufficiency. Well, you follow Abraham. That's what Abraham said. He gave tithes to Melchizedek, said, I don't want your money. I don't want you to say that you made Abraham rich. You follow Jacob. Jacob's going out, and he sees that ladder vision, and he says, God, and this is before the law. There were no requirements, and he says, God, God whatever you give me, I'm going to give a tenth back to you. I'm going to give you a tenth. And I think the tithe is a personal devotion and dependency on God. I think what we're talking about in Acts is above and beyond that. I think it's abundance beyond that, where you are giving because you have to give. And you are, you're not dependent on someone else. A big key to this, be content. Be content. Boy, come on. Look what it says, 1 Timothy 6 8. If we have food and covering, food and clothing, with these shall we be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Having food and clothing, be content. I got to tell you, because my wife and I early on, even before we had kids, we were having struggles. We had debt, we had... We were, we were struggling with our finances. It seems like we never had any money. And, you know, a car payment would come up. We had no money budgeted for it, so we had to get out the credit card. And we just kept getting this cycle. where We were going, whoa, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were out of control. And we took a Larry Burkett cl class. And I'll never forget, he read this verse, and he, he, he put out the question. He said, how much is enough? When are you going to be satisfied? How much is enough? Because if you don't know... What is enough for you, you're always going to want more. And then we read this verse, food and clothing, be content. And we looked at our budget. How much money do we spend each year on food and clothing? Just food and clothing. That's what it says we need. And we looked at that, and we looked at our income, and we're like, <laughs> we're wealthy people. Because everything else is negotiable. Everything else is negotiable. So contentment and live within your need is the first key to get in on track with this, to where you are responsible for yourself, and then you move forward to where you can help others. And then it says in Ephesians 4.28, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who is in need. Here's another big key to this. Ready for this? Okay, this is going to shock most of you. Get a job. <laughs> Work. Get a job. In our country, in this day and time, anybody can get a job. I don't care who you are. You can get a job. Get a job. Budget your money so you, so you can have, first you take care of yourself, and then the reason, I believe, the biblical reason for wealth above and beyond what you need is so you can give. So you can give to each other. Imagine, imagine if we lived this way. What if the church lived 
like this way, like the first century church. What would happen, huh? Another thing you see that they did is they went house to house. And next week, we're going to look at that, about the church in the home. And what would happen if we as a church really began to live the way that our Lord says to live. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, God. Thank you for these great truths in your scripture. God, help each and every one of us in our personal life to live as Christ would direct us, not out of obligation, not out of compulsion, but out of a cheerful heart to live and to give the way you have called us to do it, that we could live, that we could live in prayer, we can be devoted to the gospel message, we can be devoted to fellowship, we can be devoted to uh, breaking of bread, we can de be devoted to prayers, and we can be devoted to each other and live responsibly and then be able to give to others in need. God, help us to live the way Christ directs us, the way the church was meant to function. Thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.